In this episode, we'll be talking about how we can use storytelling to further improve our practice, what would happen in the design process if we started to listen to ourselves more, and when will researching the problem become as important as creating the solution. And here's the guest for this episode. Hi, I'm Steve Portugal, and this is The Service Design Show. If you're trying to design services that have a positive impact on people's lives and are good for business, then you've come to the right place. Hi, my name is Mark Fontijn and welcome to The Service Design Show. My guest in this episode is Steve Portugal. Steve is a user research consultant and advisor based in San Francisco and he's written several books on this topic which I'll tell you more about in a second. And he's running a Rolling Stones email group which is still active since 1992. His latest book is called Doorbells, Danger and Dead Batteries, User Research War Stories. And if you want to get your hands on that book, you can use this discount code ServiceDesign18-20 to get 20% off that book. You can also find this discount code down below in the show notes. In the next 30 minutes, Steve and I will be talking about how we can use storytelling to further develop our practice. We'll be talking about how the design process would change if we would actually start listening more to ourselves. And finally, we'll talk about when will researching the design problem become as important as actually creating the solution. We post new videos on this channel on a weekly basis. So if you haven't done it already, I would love to have you to subscribe and click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. And if you'd like to learn how to explain service design without actually confusing people, check out the free course that I've got for you. Click over here or check the link down below in the description of this video. That's all for the introduction and now let's quickly jump straight into the interview with Steve. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you on. Uh, we're in the worst possible time zones uh, to actually make this fit, but uh, we, we made it fit, uh, so I'm really happy with that. Uh, I, I think a lot of people know you from the books you've written, uh, presentations you've done, and it's a lot on user research. Um, but this is called the Service Design Show, and I'm really curious, um, do you remember the very first time you got in touch with service design? Is that a term that's, uh, that's on your mind? Yeah, for sure. What's, I don't know if I can remember the first time that I heard the term. Um, I remember the first service design event that I went to. Oh, really? Although, if you're going to ask me to name it and say when it was, I don't know if I can do that. Um, you, you know, I went to... Uh, some international, I'm going to be really unfair to the organizers and not remember their particular brand. Um, but it was, you know, the International Service Design Conference, which I think it's the main one, yeah. it was in San Francisco a number of years ago. Maybe it might have been eight or ten years ago at this mm. point. Mm -hmm. True. Um, and, and um, you know, there were a lot of m my pals, uh, you know, people that I might see at design and user experience conferences, at user research conferences um, uh, that were speaking, that were attending. And then it was really great because there was lots of people that I didn't know that were sort of outside <laughs> my, my, my main network. Um, but just, you know, see the, the familiar, the familiar uh, people and even some of the stories you know, uh, a lot of us are doing different work, maybe under slightly different, la or sorry, similar work under different labels. Um, and I'm not just not to say there wasn't anything fresh there or a different lens, uh, but it was pretty, it was very reassuring to mm. see like, oh yeah, this is not, like I belong here. This is, we're doing a lot of the same stuff. There's a lot of research happening here uh, and so on. And yeah. I, and I, I think what I, what's great and what I try to do with the show is sort of connect all these adjacent fields that, that overlap, but maybe uh, not necessarily talk to each other. So uh, th again, this is a great opportunity to do this in the next 25, 30 minutes. We have three really awesome topics to talk about. Uh, you sent me your topics. I've sent you a few question starters. We're going to improvise and co-create as we go along. The only question is, are you ready, Steve? Yes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Topic <clears throat> number one. And we already were talking about stories. And this topic is 
really short and it's called storytelling. Do you have a question starter and can you show it to us that goes along with this topic? Drum roll. Yes. All right. This is like the special effects portion. <laughs> How, How can we? What's the question? Right. I mean, uh, it's an area I'm really interested in. How can we use storytelling? Uh, how can we kind of embrace storytelling and, and accept it as a, as a valid tool and a, an effective process for, I mean, really what I'm thinking about is uh, developing the practice. I mean, so we talk about storytelling as, a, as an interview technique. You know, you're interviewing me here. I already told a story. It, it's going to be sort of a, a mode of interaction, a mode of discourse. We talk about products that tell stories, service experiences that are stories. Um, but I'm really interested in, you know, some of what you're trying to accomplish here. When we bring professionals together, people that are in a community of practice, um, I'm really interested in storytelling as uh, a valid and effective tool for um, you know, evolving a shared understanding of best practices, uh, communicating the nuance of what it's like to be doing that work. Um, you know, and I, this is, I mean, I, I don't want to cut you off here. You're like, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, already so many questions because one of the things is what you said yeah. something like to make it a valid tool or, or a valid method. What, what do we need to actually make it valid? Isn't storytelling by default valid or, you know, how does it need to evolve? Um, I suspect that storytelling is kind of discounted culturally among certain professionals, um, uh, especially as a thing that we do together. I mean, I don't think that uh, we give enough space to professional development. When we do, it's very goal directed. I mean, if you have ever uh, been asked to write a proposal for uh, creating a training, you're asked to create, um, what are their terms like, the educational outcomes or the learning objectives. There's sort of a lot of formalism in that. And I don't mean to, I'm not trying to be negative about that. that. I'm sort of saying, in addition, um, when you do, uh, when you tell stories, there's, there's things that happen. and and maybe it's okay, and maybe that's good, and maybe it's better, or it's different, but we have to allow for that. Uh, that's kind of what, I, what I'm, so, so I, I want stories to be recognized and accepted and embraced and given space. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm aiming for. But, and that's not going to happen by itself, right? How, how, do, we, how do we get there? Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, tell a story about something that I did. Go ahead. Um, that, you know, uh, so this is about modeling. I think one, one way to get there is, is to, you know, how do, we, how do we create repetitions of behaviors we're interested in? We'll do them and talk about them. So let me just be specific. Um, you know, an area I've been interested in user research specifically is that it's a very messy process. It's a process that involves interactions between humans. And again, we can have our bolted list of learning objectives, and but things always happen. Um, and, and over the years of my career, I've been interested in talking to people about stuff that happens, like that's just what it's <laughs> like. And then maybe those exchanges are valuable. So I started a project um, probably about four years ago to collect war stories from user researchers. Uh, and, and, uh, I think I got about 70 stories or something like this over a number of years. Um, and then I wrote a book about those stories, uh, which, you know, it, it, it collects these stories from researchers about the things that happens and it talks about what we learn. Uh, so I think there's all these different levels. One is just, um, sort of unsynthesized, uninterpreted stories. Stories are just told. And so for years, uh, you could go to, you still can go to this place, uh, this area of the blog on my website and just read stories about what happened. And, you know, I, I, in editing these stories, I kind of pushed researchers not to make everything into a lesson mm -hmm. uh, because we're trained to do that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them just to say what happened. 
and and sometimes people need a little help in storytelling. You know, what's the uh, what's the setting? Where were you? Who was there? Why were you there? Describe what happened. What's the moment? I think they call it sometimes the inciting incident. What's the point at which something happened? Um, and then what did you think about? What did you feel? What did you do? And then where did we go? Mm. And then people sometimes want to wrap that up and say, well, here's what to do differently in the future. And, and I've really been interested in, I mean, certain kinds of stories about research, especially there is nothing that you could have done better, you know? And so there's stories of failure, but by telling these stories over and over again, it starts to reframe the notion of failure and just uh, teach us some bigger ideas around acceptance, around um, preparing for failure doesn't mean preventing failure, uh, doesn't mean, you know, and then so anyway, the book was a really lot of fun to write because I just looked at all these stories and see, oh, there's a whole category of, uh, you know, people put into ethically challenging situations. There's a whole category of people being uh, concerned about their safety. Um, and you, so you take all these stories and, and everyone handles them in a different way. The story, the circumstances are different and the, the rationalization and the problem solving process, uh, which may just be accepting that you can't solve it, <coughs> excuse me, it, it is different. And so, um, so again, that's kind of the second level is, is synthesizing these stories and seeing what lessons we have from them. So I think it works on two levels. Like if we just tell stories we create, um, uh, you know, there's catharsis. That's why we tell stories. It's a very human thing. Um, they're, they uh, engage people in a, in a practice that is more complicated than what's in a presentation of mine mm. or what's in somebody's book or Medium article. It is very personal. It's very human. And so these stories start to uh, accrue in a way that characterizes the practice in a very authentic way that no bullet points can. And if we start to look at those stories for what they teach us, they start to uh, you know, provide ways to kind of level up the practice of user research, um, I think in a profound way and in a slippery and elusive way, like things that fall between the cracks of what you're gonna learn in training and even what you will learn in the field if you don't ever reflect on it. So it's, it's bringing that reflective learning and, and just saying like, hey, here's a space for it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of been my, my exploration with stories and with war stories about research. Mm -hmm. um, do you also think that uh, uh, we as a design community should be more deliberate and practice and, and uh, practice storytelling? In, learn the structure, learn the, uh, learn the basics, l learn the basics of storytelling in instead of just doing it by intuition. Yes, I mean, uh, this and this fall under the category of should designers do X? Yes. Um, well, yeah, is I it mean, a fundamental I, I skill? That's maybe a better question. Do you think yes. it's a fundamental yeah, yeah. skill? Yes, it's not a, it's not naturally occurring in everybody, mm. which I think is kind of what you're getting at. Um, right. I think many of us are right. We're all storytellers. It's just, I think, a very human thing. Some of us may be more shy, or more uncomfortable uh, or not feel confident about it. Um, some of us may have, uh, in, you know, intuitively grasped the structure of a good story and others may just need to have it kind of articulated. Mm. Um, you know, so the, the, my experience in curating and editing lots and lots of stories, uh, you know, taught me more specifically what some of the, the best practices were. Mm -hmm. There's many, many, many kinds of stories, right? I created, I, I formalized this idea of the user research war story, but that's not the only kind of story there is. And you could, you know, generate hundreds of types of stories, but I think, uh, practicing storytelling, you know, creating and telling your own stories, listening to other stories and kind of peeling apart their structure and so on is, is really great. It's a, it's a powerful creative tool. Mm -hmm. Like it's good for communicating. It's good for, I mean, you know, like I said before, we, 
we make things that tell stories or that, you know, help people experience stories. And so having a grasp of those different narrative structures, I think, is, you know, is powerful because it helps us reorganize information in different ways mm. and, and receive information in different ways and kind of re, you know, you, that's a lot of what my work is, is kind of taking things in and re reorganizing them, structuring them, and then, you know, sharing them back out. And that's, that's a sort of a master level of storytelling that you have to be able to do. Mm. All right. Storytelling. Let's uh, close off this topic and, uh, see what the other ones bring us because those are uh, at least as interesting for me i think as as the first one um uh, let's leave that one for the end <clears throat> topic number two i've picked this one listening to ourselves do you have a question starter and it may be the same yeah. one as you used before that's okay you can use the wild card it's up to you what do we get this time? My question starter is, I feel like I need a little bit of drama here. My question starter is, <laughs> what if, what if we were better at listening to ourselves? Um, you know, this is, I guess, kind of a, uh, a hopeful or an encouragement framing for it. Um, and when I say listening to ourselves, it's, it's what's in our heads and our hearts that is unrecognized. Um, you know, I think you see this in your work, you see this in your relationships. Um, the more we are in touch with what we hope or what we believe or what our biases are, um, the more we are open to creating something new. Um, so I think, you know, this is sort of, it, it, this works at various levels, right? I mean, this works, I think of this very practically, uh, in interpersonal interactions. So, uh, interviewing job candidates, interviewing user research participants, in a meeting with our colleagues, our clients, our stakeholders. Um, and I think sometimes we catch, I think we know this experience when it breaks down, right? When we are, uh, like the phenomenon of being anxious about something and not realizing that we're anxious until the relief comes, like, um, you're expecting a negative results in an interaction and the person says, uh, you know, gives you some approval and you realize, oh, wow, it's like I have been in my jaw and my shoulders and my chest. I've just been stuck. I've been so kind of clenched on fearing a negative outcome that uh, uh, and now I feel the relief. And, you know, of course, that's we don't perform in our best when we are when we are stuck like that, when we are just so locked down, um, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, interview a participant and sort of engage with what their life is like for them, and you are sort of caught up in uh, what you have to do next, mm, or yeah. um, what you hope that they say, or what you believe the right outcome is for some testing or for some exploratory work, then it's it blocks you from being open to what they're really telling you. And if I mean, if, if you've ever sat in with somebody doing this, you can really it's harder to see in ourselves. It's easy to see in somebody else, you know, when they're they're asking questions and they're just sort of listening to the information that they've already decided that they needed as opposed to being more open. And so it's great to say, well, be more open, be a good listener. Um, I. I'm sort of raising this what if question about listening to ourselves because my thesis is um, my thesis. I don't I don't mean to claim this. I mean, I'm sort of echoing things that I've heard and learned and read and experienced myself that uh, the better you are at hearing what your what's what's not what's blocking you or just where you are already framed. If you know that about yourself, then you are in a better place to see the other person for where they're at and and to give of yourself in kind of the richest, most authentic way uh, to, to build that connection, to have that interaction, to solve that problem together at the whiteboard or to be creative with somebody else or to, you know, to to jam, uh, you know, to do your guitar jam, uh, you know, with with your your fellow musician, whatever it is, if you're blocked, you can't kind of get there. And if you hear yourself. And I'm not saying don't have biases, don't have fears, 
don't have judgment. Like that's who we are. Um, but if you can hear those things about yourself, then you can choose how to handle any of these situations, work, creative, interpersonal, uh, that you find yourself in. Um, so that's my kind of what if for myself, <laughs> for sure. Um, we can ask the same question as we did in the previous uh, uh, topic we talked about, uh, where we said storytelling is like a skill or a tool that we need to master. Is this also a, a tool or a skill, listening to ourselves? Yeah, yes. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we can't go to a conference now in, in our fields without there being a session about uh, mindfulness, right? It's become, uh, and I mean, I've given a talk about mindfulness. I don't mean to, to be negative about that that topic. I, I think it's real, obviously I think it's interesting. I mean, I think mindfulness is sort of another label for what I'm talking about, being present. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to delve very, so yes, I think it's a it's a skill and a, and a, and a, and a process, or to use the language of mindfulness, they call it a practice. Right. It's you have a, a mindfulness practice or a meditation practice. Uh, and I love that word because it kind of tells you, you know, it, it tells you that what you're doing is always practicing. Like that's what it means to do it. Not mm. that you, uh, you know, check it off a list of accomplishments, but you just you just work that cycle. Uh, you just do it. And the practice is the thing that you're doing. Um, but if you don't have to look very far into mindfulness to get to like actual tactical things that you can do to be more present. And so, you know, a lot of it is about the body versus the mind and, you know, listening to your breath and, you know, there's how to meditate is about, um, you know, separating kind of this from, from this. And, and, and so there are, there are ways to do it. So I think, you know, yes. And to what you said, yes, it's a thing that, uh, that, should be learned and can be learned and and that there are tools and practices mm -hmm. to help us achieve that we started with a question what if we do this but uh, if you think about this topic what is the thing that still puzzles you or that you would like to explore regarding this topic <sighs> yeah um i mean uh you know, I know I'm sitting here in California, and I don't want to sound like uh, like like uh, some some hippie 30 years later or something, <laughs> uh, because I I don't think I am that person. But uh, but sort of what's stopping us? How can we be better at it? Um, you know, it, it's those two things. I think do, you know do do we know? And I say this about myself. I mean. You know, I don't want to sound like this is the hippie thing that I'm sort of, you know, telling everybody what they should be doing. I mean, these are certainly challenges for me. Um, you know what? Because if you explore it, you start to understand uh, how you can be just more comfortable and more effective. But uh, there's a lot of forces that we uh, subject ourselves to that that pull us away from that. So what is that? How can we help ourselves or help each other um, just take advantage of some simple things to just work better, more calmly, more productively, more creatively? Um, you know, how to, and how does that fit? How does that fit into sort of the, the structures of work life uh, where we talk about speed, we talk about results, we talk, you know, we live efficiency. Yes. Um, that's really like these gods that we kind of worship now. And, um, you know, when we do work that, that needs us to be reflective, uh, that needs us to have time that doesn't fit onto a, uh, calendar, you know, in the typical way, you know, what, mm -hmm. how do we, how do we do that for ourselves? How do we support that? I don't know. I mean, I, I am definitely, these are things I struggle with like everybody else, I think, mm -hmm. but. Uh, we'll be in touch in a year or something like that and see how far you've come regarding <laughs> that question. I'll just be ex extra, you know, expounding about it as maybe, if I have Maybe a knowledge. new book. Maybe a new book. Who knows? <laughs> ready, right. ready to move on to uh, the final topic? All right. <clears throat> um, this one is called 
making versus looking and I had to narrow it down so it's more cryptic yeah. than it was and what question starter did you pick? Yeah, uh, all right. Hmm. When will, when will we uh, give equal time, if not greater time, to the uh, to the looking part? And so maybe I can explain what making versus yeah. looking means, uh, and then then I then I can say what when will looks like. Um, uh, yeah, you had you had to get it down to one sheet, uh, <laughs> and I think there are there are many different approaches to putting new things, services, products, experiences, designs, technologies, whatever the thing is. There's a lot of there's many approaches to putting it out in the world, um, uh, but it seems like the default, the one that has the mind share, uh, is that is sort of a, a maker's first approach. Um, you know, I'm interested in a topic, uh, and so here's my best shot at solving this or creating a better mm. experience mm. for somebody. Mm. So let's make that. Let's put it in the world. Um, and I think you can be very shallow and, like, you can tweak it to improve it, or you can use that thing that you put out in the world as a tool to help you understand the world better. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, that's the best form of, of experimentation or of interventions. Um, but what seems to get less, uh, you know, less love and less utilization is looking first. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's, the, so the maker is kind of primary, but I'm interested in looking first because that's what I do. Uh, and I so often ha have these really wonderful experiences of looking at a behavior like, um, uh, what's the really, you know, I, we did a project a few years ago where we looked at, um, where people have strong emotional relationships to products, services, brands, categories. We just looked at that emotional linkage. Um, and so it was really, really interesting to explore the behaviors, the motivations, and then pull lessons and design principles out of that to say, uh, you know, for the organization we were supporting, here's how you could change the way that you make things in order to leverage these principles. Um, and so, I mean, and, and I get involved many times where they've done the making first and never asked the question about what is this thing? What does it mean? What are the goals you're trying to accomplish? And so now we're sort of faced with trying to improve the thing that's already been made uh, when maybe if we had done a, we would have made a different thing if we'd started, mm -hmm. you know, from a different mm -hmm. point of view. Um, so, you know, when will we learn? When will, um, you know, the relationship between sort of research and design, if you will, uh, get to the point where um, we can leverage all the power of research to really make much greater and more effective things? Uh, if we just s switch the order around a little bit, that's my that's my plea. And and it you know and it also uh, makes sense from an economical point of view, right? Uh, we I always tell my clients that we need to balance sort of the time and investment we put into the problem space versus the solution space. That's what you're calling making. I think we had this uh, you you had this down in the, in the original line. The problem space is, you know, we should spend half our time there before we actually start creating stuff, making solutions. Become, because sometimes the solution might be actually to not do something <laughs> at all or to, yes. to, to find a new path. Or, uh, so from an economical standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to actually spend a lot of time in the looking, in the, in the, in the problem space, right? I agree. Um, and and, and what's, sort of what's holding us back? Um, well, I think there may be sort of an, uh, maybe an economic fallacy in that we have people whose core skills is making. You know, normally that's like designers, engineers. Apps, websites. We can't have them idle. Oh. <laughs> right? We got to have them doing something. Mm. Um, mm. So uh, yeah. let's get them working. Mm. Right. Mm. And, and so, uh, mm. you know, the more they're working and so, yeah, you know, being able to iterate rapidly seems like 
uh, maybe a compromise that includes some of this philosophy. Um, so we're not making the perfect thing. We're making a thing that we can change quickly. We have to look busy. But we're still making. <laughs> I'm sorry? We have to look busy. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It goes back to that other piece about, you know, we can't sort of be reflective or engage with the problem. Uh, we have to be we have to be busy. That's efficiency. Right. If you've got staff. So it's like the tail wagging the dog. Right. You have staff that have certain skill sets. So your process has to be uh, kind of crafted to uh, give them things to do. Mm -hmm. That to your point, that doesn't always get you to where, you know, the the right thing. Mm -hmm. It could be no thing, mm -hmm. but it's a little late. Mm -hmm. I, one of the comparisons I try to make uh, when uh, sort of talking about the problem space is like archaeology. You know, we need to get out there and do a guesstimate of where we think the old ruins might be and just start digging and looking around and looking, looking, trying stuff, you know, uh, and, and looking for clues, right? Uh, and and yeah. with an archaeologist, we all understand that that's how it works and that's the only way to actually get value, to get results, right? And I, and I see the same in the uh, regarding research. You need to get out there, you need to start digging, you need to start looking, finding clues and uh, well, as soon as you do that, you will uh, get a step further. You, there, there is no sub substitute. Are, are you? <laughs> That's good, yeah. Are you are you hopeful that we'll be able to pull this off? That at what at some point we'll actually get this in balance? Yeah, I think you know. I alternate between being pessimistic and, and hopeful. Just uh, you know, just watching some of the discussions that go on in different platforms or in different events. Um, you know, I think the thing that's happening in user research that I'm excited about uh, and frankly intimidated about is um, is a kind of a coming of age of the practice. Uh, there's just there's so many people doing research work. I mean, it's I think lots and lots of professionals that might call themselves something else do research, but there's more and more researchers. And so the uh, the the discussions are elevating. Uh you know, I think you need to sort of have a, a critical mass of individuals with a certain amount of experience to start taking on some of these process things. Um, I just saw, uh, as kind of a small signal, um, somebody put on a webinar or a conference call about um, what does it mean when you're a researcher and you're managing designers? And so just think about, you know, how teams are structured. Like, that's not something that could have happened just based on populations a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And now it's a common enough problem that people want to get together and just kind of address what are the implications of that. Mm -hmm. So I think you have more researchers, you have more reflections, you have more researchers in leadership roles. And so, um, you know, addressing these questions of how do we best practice, there's more people to advocate yeah, yeah. for different approaches. So that gives me some hope or some, you know, some encouragement that, um, you know, these people get it and they want to make change and we can, you know, we can work on this together. And let's hope initiatives like this just help to accelerate that because, you know, it's innovative, in, inevitable and we, it, it's only a matter of how fast we'll get there. And I, let's hope our talk contributes to that, right? <laughs> right. And, and let's just put the caveat in, not every problem requires one approach. Like I said, there's multiple approaches. And I think, you know, make to experiment is valid, um, but it's not the only approach and yeah. it shouldn't be the dominant yeah. approach. And, yeah. and, you know, we have to choose how to go about it. Steve, this is uh, your opportunity to ask the people, to ask the mass audience of the Service Design Show a question that you would like us to think about, reflect upon and comment on, on this episode. What is that? Yeah, I want to go back to the the storytelling uh, theme and, um, you know, because you, you kind of challenged in a good way, like, is this, uh, should this be kind of considered a valid thing and, 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 and what's sort of getting in the way? I guess I'd love for people to think about it and I'd like to hear from people about, um, you know, it's, it's the researcher question, like, when has it worked? When has it not worked? What are the barriers? That's kind of how, right, how you structure a lot of questions. 
if you think about uh, a lot of the scenarios we explored, um, you know, collaboration, leadership, kind of in the organization itself, uh, developing a practice, advocating for best practices, um, you know, when has storytelling been effective in, in getting towards that? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then sort of the, the, the counterpart is, you know, in situations where it hasn't been effective, what's got in the way? What's, what's been the blocker? I'd love to, you know, reflect on that a little bit because I'm I'm holding it up as this thing, uh, but people there's a lot of experiences people have that I think we could dig into it a little bit. So, so let's talk about effective storytelling, and then we we are into the effective part again. <laughs> when is storytelling effective? Yeah, we're not, and let's not define effectiveness. Let's just let that be defined by people who have hmm. who've you know, had some objective or had some outcome that maybe was a surprising Mm. outcome, Mm. beneficial. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Let's hope a lot of people comment uh, on on this question. We'll we'll challenge them to do that. Um, You know, time flew by. Uh, Steve, I really want to thank you for sharing what's on your mind, challenging us to think about some of this stuff. And uh, if they want, they can get your books uh, and uh, dig more into this and check your website your presentation. So uh, thanks again for making the time to be on the show. Uh, Thank you very much. It was a really great discussion and I hope it's valuable for people. Awesome. So what is your tip for making storytelling work? Leave your comments down below. If you enjoyed this episode, please give a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. And of course, if you know someone who might benefit from what we've just discussed, please share this video with them. And if you'd like to learn how to explain service design without confusing people, check the free course that I've got for you over here or see the description of this video. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.